Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I am here with my December wrap-up. Oh, by the way, uh, shout out to Andrea from Book Ramble because I am wearing the lip gloss that she gave me as part of my Secret Santa gift, and I absolutely love it. I love you, Andrea. The first book I finished in December was The Ruby Circle by Rochelle Mead. This is the sixth and final book in the Bloodline series. I'm glad to be done. Uh, I really enjoyed most of the series, but this one was unfortunately really disappointing for me. Basically, I feel like the plot of this one just really... It meandered quite a bit. Um, a lot of the things that the main characters ended up doing sort of felt like they didn't matter in the end, and I had some real issues with the characterization. Like Adrian and Sydney, I just didn't even care about seeing them together anymore, which was a real bummer because I did really enjoy their interactions in previous books. And I'm gonna get into spoilers here because there's really no way to talk about one of my main issues without spoiling things, so I will put a timestamp down below for if you want to skip uh, the spoilers, but here's my big problem. Uh, one of the characters in this book literally only existed to get pregnant and die so that she could leave her child to Sydney and Adrian so they could play like parents. And I I hate that. It was so it was so frustrating because it was very obvious to me that that was the only reason that character existed in the book. So overall, I really didn't like this book. I am glad I finished the series and I didn't actually hate the epilogue as much as I was expecting to, but I, I don't know. I had quite a few issues with it. I still highly recommend the Bloodline series, but the Ruby Circle I ended up giving 2.5 stars to. Next, I finished Mistaking Her Character by Maria Grace, and unfortunately this was another disappointment. Uh, this is a Pride and Prejudice sort of reimagining or retelling in that uh, quite a few circumstances of the original novel are different. Different. So uh, Mr. Bennett is actually a doctor and he is on, um, he's basically Lady Catherine de Bourgh's um, private physician. Like he lives on their, uh, on their grounds and with his whole family and everything. So uh, all of the Bennets have grown up very differently because of that situation. And that aspect I thought was really interesting and pretty well done. It was fascinating to see how those circumstances changed the way Lizzie grew up and changed her personality and how she interacted with people. I actually thought that was um, pretty believable for the most part, even though she's extremely different from Lizzie Bennet in the original novel. I think that it made sense for the most part. At the beginning, I was really enjoying this. I liked the writing, I liked the, the way the setting was done, and then <laughs> things just started going downhill. I could not stand the uh, Mr. Darcy character. I hated him. And I say Mr. Darcy character, even though like he was Mr. Darcy, like that was his name and supposedly that's who he was, but he was completely unrecognizable from the original novel. And that didn't really make sense because his circumstances were basically the same as in the original story. So I think this would have been much better if she had just dropped the Pride and Prejudice outline altogether and just done like an original story because otherwise like this basically read like a completely separate story with characters that just happen to have the same name. Every time Darcy and Elizabeth were together, I was like rolling my eyes and cringing so hard. Like all of their dialogue was so cheesy and so bad. And I just like, I hated seeing them interact. Like I dreaded their scenes together. And that is not something you want between Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet. Like that's not what you want from any romantic relationship really. And I just like found this so frustrating. And also like Elizabeth's character, like I liked her at the beginning, but she started to become like inhumanly perfect and gifted and wonderful. And it was just like, like way beyond the normal, like, oh, this main character is just like a little too good at everything. It was like, is there anything in the world that Elizabeth was not born knowing how to do? I don't think so. And it got to the point, like, this was so ridiculous. She would talk to characters, like, even people she really didn't know well. And it was like she was freaking Sherlock Holmes. She was like, oh, well, I see by the way your coat is buttoned that you just went in to talk to so-and-so and she gave you a drink. And it's like, what? Like, how do you know this? Like, it was just like, it was absurd, really. And that really got to me because she, she did it all the time. And even the writing, I, got, I liked it less and less as we went on because so much of it was spent in the cheesiest, most like cringe inducing lines between the love interests. And yeah, um, I really didn't like this. I ended up giving it two stars. I might still continue the series because the later books are about Lydia and Mary Bennett, which are two stories I'm really more interested in. I think that maybe I was just too close to the original characters in this one. Next, I finished The Ugly Goddess by Elsa Marston, and this was a childhood favorite of mine. This is an ancient Egypt historical fiction novel, and we follow three main characters. Uh, one of them is Princess Merit. She is the Egyptian princess, and she's being sent to have this ceremonial marriage to the god Amun to, like, bring peace and prosperity to Egypt. And this is an honor, but she doesn't want to go because she wants to actually do something different with her life. And then Hector, we follow him, too, and he is a Greek officer. And this is when the Greeks are sort of occupying Egypt or like they're mercenaries, but 
like the, Egypt the Egyptians don't really trust them for being there, but they rely on them for protection a lot of times. And then we're also following Bata, who is a lowly servant, and he actually is one of the people who helps transport or care for the statue of the goddess Taurette, who is the ugly goddess of the title. And it's about him bringing this statue to Merit, and him and Hector actually end up working together to bring the statue to her, although Hector doesn't really care about that so much. And this was really good. I don't think I enjoyed it quite as much as I did when I was younger, just because I think I have a better handle on my particular reading tastes as far as historical fiction go goes. It's not like I outgrew this book, I think I just have a clearer idea of what things I like in a story now, but I did still really enjoy it. The characters are really really great. Bata especially, I appreciate so much more now, like he's just like the most kind and wonderful person. And another thing I really like about this book is the, the large number of important topics and handles, like it talks about class differences and religion and differences between cultures and how you can work together and like work to understand each other's perspective and things like that, and I think there was a lot of that that was handled really well. I did feel like the writing wasn't consistent really, like I sort of feel like the author couldn't make up her mind if she wanted it to be a very like old-fashioned sounding style to match the older time period or if she wanted to make it very approachable for younger readers or readers who weren't familiar with this time period. But overall I did really enjoy this. I had also completely forgotten the ending to this book. <laughs> like it really surprised me. The author went some places that I like didn't expect with this, which was kind of cool, and I gave The Ugly Goddess 3.75 stars. Next I finished The Barefoot Book of Stories from the Opera, retold by Sherwood Hussein, illustrated by James Mayhew. And this is a book of stories from the opera, as it says, and the illustrations are really beautiful. It's like a really interesting style too like really bright. I've read several books about this that are for the ballet, but I haven't read any for the opera yet, and I really did enjoy this one. Actually my favorite was La Cerenentola, I think that's how you say it, by Giacchino Rossini, and that's like basically an Italian version of Cinderella, or one of the older versions of Cinderella, and that was actually a really nice surprise because that's not a story I tend to connect with too much um, in retellings or basically anything. It's like I like it, it's fine, but it's not my favorite. I did really enjoy this, and I there's something very cozy to me about um, about these kinds of books that tell stories from opera or ballet or, you know, any kind of show like that. This kind of storybook format I think is really enjoyable. You don't have to be a kid to enjoy this. And actually with this one, uh, there are several several of these operas where maybe I wouldn't actually recommend reading this to children because they get very dark, but I did enjoy this and I gave it four stars. Next I finished Blue Lily Lily Blue by Maggie Stiefvater. I'm so proud of myself I said that name without slurring over it. This title is so hard for me to say for some reason. This is the third book in the Raven Cycle series and I buddy read this with my lovely friend Huck from Badger Reads, and I did really enjoy this one. I can't give away too much because it is the third book in the series, but I know a lot of people hate this one. I know several people who read it recently and really hated this one, but I liked it. I know one of the criticisms is that it doesn't add too much to the overall plot, but like I don't read these books for the plot, I read them for the characters and the atmosphere, so it didn't bother me too much. I will say the epilogue enraged me. It had like a couple of my absolute least favorite storytelling tropes or like techniques I guess you could say. Um, I hated that. I would give the epilogue like two stars, but I did really enjoy the book overall, so I ended up giving Blue Lily Lily Blue 4.5 stars. Next I finished Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri, and this is a desert fantasy novel that is based on the Mughal Empire of India, I believe, and I loved this. I don't want to tell you too much about the plot because I think it's best to go into this one not really knowing what to expect. There are these deva creatures and this um, this like dreaming magic almost. It's really, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's done really well. And Mare, our female lead, is just so wonderful. I absolutely adore her as a character. I love her love interest and all of their interactions were just like so pure and wholesome, especially in the midst of this really uh, dark and tense situation and political climate. Uh, the villain in this is like pretty terrifying. I don't think Tasha Suri shies away from showing consequences to people's actions, and that's something I did appreciate, but this is just like fantastic. Like the world building was brilliant. I can see some people feeling like maybe this was a little too slow in places, but I still really enjoyed it. I mean, I tend to like slow burn fantasy anyway, but I think that especially in this case, it was done so well because you still felt like things were happening, and I gave Empire of Sand 5 out of 5 stars. Next I finished Ghost Talkers by Mary Robinette Kowal. This is a sort of historical fiction paranormal book, and it's set during World War One. and there's something called the Spirit Corps, and it's basically a team of mediums, and their job is to kind of collect or draw the souls of fallen soldiers for the Allied 
uh, powers and to get information from them that they saw right before their death. The Germans don't know that they have this ability, but part of the conflict is that the Allies are worried that the other side will find out about this, uh, this sort of ace up their sleeve. And I absolutely loved the concept of this book. I think one of my favorite things about it was how believable the the world felt and the integration of this spirit core into the war effort and into the culture and the world of this book. How would this change our our perception of the military? Like how would this change the way we use battle strategy? But unfortunately the places where this book fell short for me were the characters. Ginger, our main character, like she was fine. Um, she was likable enough, I guess, but like she really didn't leave an impression on me. And her love interest, her fiance, he just I really did not care about him at all. Uh, again, there's nothing that made me particularly dislike him, but I just like, I was just painfully neutral about the whole situation. And unfortunately their love story is really like the emotional core of this story. Like there is plot and there are other things going on, but you really have to care about their love story in order to care about a good chunk of the story. And I just didn't. I think one of my favorite parts were actually some of the side characters that we got to see very briefly. Um, I didn't really like what the author did with one of the one of the reveals, I think, I didn't really enjoy that or the way she handled that, but something I did really love was actually like one of the smallest elements of the story, but that was when we actually got glimpses of these ghosts or these spirits from the soldiers and hearing their last words and hearing the messages they gave to people, that was really, really emotional. I felt a much more intense emotional connection to those parts of the story than I did with anything else with the main characters, but it was really affecting to hear these little things from people where it's like, tell my brother that I hid his Christmas present under my bed. I was planning on being there to give it to him and things like that. Like those things I think were so poignant and I think those were really well done. If the concept interests you, I think you could read it and still really enjoy it, but I ended up giving Ghost Talkers three stars. Next I finished Cruel Beauty by Rosamund Hodge. This was actually a reread for the booktube rereadathon project. This is a Beauty and the Beast retelling, but it's way more than that. There are also some Greek mythology influences and uh, I think there's some other like folktale influences as well. And I understand this is a really pretty unpopular <laughs> retelling, I think. Um, I really enjoyed it when I first read it and I still enjoy it now. I know there are so many things wrong with it or that you could argue are wrong with it. Like I know the world building is very confusing for some people. I totally get that the main character Nyx is like really frustrating at times. Like there, there are a lot of things about this where it shouldn't have worked for me, but I just enjoyed it anyway. But actually, as I was reading it, I was kind of disappointed because I remember, I remember loving the romantic relationship so much more than I did the first time. And I was so like, that was, that was a big thing that I was kind of disappointed in. I was like, am I not going to enjoy this as much as I did? But the ending, which I know a lot of people hate, and I actually really enjoyed the first time I read it, I got to the ending and I think I love it even more than I did the first time. So that actually bumped my rating up. So I still ended up giving Cruel Beauty four stars. And I understand it's not for everyone. I do still like Crimson Bound better than this one, but I really enjoyed it. Next I finished A Sky Painted Gold by Laura Wood and this is a historical fiction set in I think it's the 1920s, yeah the summer of 1929 in Cornwall. And it's definitely got some influences from The Great Gatsby. Uh, there are even quotations from that book that are kind of used to separate sections of this novel, but I think the thing that this book reminded me of even more than The Great Gatsby was I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith because there's that feeling of growing up and childhood into adulthood. The style felt a little similar to the writing style and the sister relationships reminded me of that and the whole plot gets kicked off where when these um these wealthy people move into their house like this very palatial estate next door to our main character Lou that's kind of what sets everything in motion so that feels very I capture the castle and I ended up absolutely adoring this book I was hoping to enjoy it obviously but I I was blown away by how much I loved this and how much it got under my skin like there were so many really beautiful uh friendships and relationships and like family like family bonds and everything and actually like this is one of the only times I remember I really, really didn't like the main love interest when we first met them, and I, I did not think that it was going to work out for me. But by the end of it, I absolutely loved him with like my whole heart, and yeah, this ended up just being so wonderful. And another thing I like is that it doesn't sugarcoat stuff. Like this is a very cozy feeling book, but it also covers some things like drug abuse and alcohol abuse and sexism and racism of the time period. Like there's just there's a lot that it that it tackles, I think, in a kind of understated ways, but it just, oh, I just loved this one. So I ended up giving A Sky Painted Gold five stars. Next, I finally finished a book that has been hanging over my head since the end of October when I started it, and that was A Mad Wicked Folly by Sharon Biggs Waller. This is a historical fiction type romance. I'm gonna follow a young girl, what's her name? I can't even remember. Victoria Darling, of course it is. Uh, she's a painter 
and she wants to do that professionally. She wants to like go to the Academy of Art or something in England, but because of the scandal when she posed nude in France at her painter studio or whatever, she gets sent back home in disgrace and her parents take away all her drawing and painting things and so she's trying to get into the school. And then she comes across a very handsome policeman and or constable and he becomes her muse and she wants to paint him and there's also this like suffrage um, subplot as well. She starts getting involved in the Votes for Women movement in England. I had so many problems with this book. I don't even, I don't even know where to start. Um, first of all, Victoria Darling herself, the main character, was awful. I hated her. Um, she hated all other women who like did not do things the exact same way she did. Uh, it was very much like a not like other girls and feminine things are stupid and if you like to wear a dress, then you must have like three brain cells to rub together. She was such a snob, but she like didn't realize she was a snob. And even though we kind of get some character development where she starts realizing that she's been like looking down on people who don't have as much money than her or who are different from her, it's not enough. Like she she makes barely any progress and we're supposed to feel like, oh, she's a feminist now. Like, no, she's not. There was just no spark for me. I know a lot of people really enjoyed the romance, but like for me personally, if the main character meets a love interest for like the second time and she's already feeling butterflies every time she talks at him, like talks to him or looks at his face or whatever, like I'm not going to be interested. There's no conflict there. There was no like development of their relationship. And even, even setting aside the fact that I think it, their relationship started too fast, just their interactions were like not enjoyable at all. Like, something that really bothered me, I don't know if this would bother other people, but she, she's afraid of closed spaces. She has claustrophobia and she's terrified of going on the underground. So he forces her to go and like he does take her with him and like he does check in with her that she's doing okay and everything and of course she ends up like totally not minding and everything is okay and like they so then she's like a pro and she can take the underground whenever she wants but that that didn't sit right with me like i don't know like i know exposure therapy is a thing but like that should be done by qualified people and i don't know it's like if some guy forced me into a closed space because i also have claustrophobia like if some guy forced me to like confront that like when i barely know him and i had not been prepared for this i would not be a fan of him like that that would not be a good way to earn my affections and i understand that like f like phobias are like very different for different people like i personally don't usually have too much of an issue on subways but this just like that really bothered me about him and the fact that I wasn't already liking him anyway like that just kind of made it worse oh and also another thing I didn't like Victoria like cheated on these two guys because there's kind of a love triangle but not really because her family sets her up with this rich eligible young man and she decides that this is perfect he's gonna pay for her to go to school and like that's how she's gonna get what she wants and she meets him and they actually like get along okay like he does some like shady things too that sort of get fixed later so I'm not saying he's like a great person and she should have ended up with him but like the constant cheating on both of these dudes, I just like didn't, I didn't understand it. Like she was the most indecisive person. And so the only things I did actually like were, um, they reference John Williams Waterhouse is one of her favorite paintings. And I actually did a whole video on him and like wrecking books based on his paintings. And I do really like his work. So that was kind of cool. Another little thing I did like about this book was like the little glimpses of, uh, of life in this time period. And I do think the author did her research, like how calling cards worked and how ladies maids actually helped women get dressed and things like that. But then sometimes it seemed like she didn't know anything about the time period because like Vicky runs around by herself all day and literally no one notices. Like her parents are supposed to be so strict and like punishing her and like nobody notices that she just sneaks out her window and things. It was just, it was ridiculous. Um, I didn't like this at all. I gave it two stars because there were a few, very few redeeming factors, but I don't recommend it. I seem to be in the minority though. This has amazing reviews on Goodreads. So feel free to ignore everything I just said. <laughs> Next, I finished The Enchanted Sonata by Heather Dixon Walwork, and this is actually a gift from my wonderful friend Kevin over at Story Glyph, so thank you so much, Kevin. And I was so excited to get this one because I started reading it, I think, Christmas Eve or maybe the day before, and I finished it Christmas Day. This was just such a wonderful book to read around Christmas time, and it is kind of a nutcracker retelling, but there's also quite a bit about the Pied Piper, and we follow our main character, Clara, and she sort of gets transported to this magical world, and I really loved how music was used as as magic almost like I loved those descriptions and I absolutely loved some of the characters and I mentioned recently in a video how much I love side character relationships and there's one in here that just like fills my heart with so much joy and warmth and love and it's just it's just wonderful every time they interacted I was like squealing and I did still really like the main relationship and the main characters I actually found Clara like really fun and enjoyable and uh, like clever and I think she also like reacted in pretty believable ways for the most part um, with all these like wild things that are happening to her I ended up loving this book the world building was great I enjoyed the writing I just think like this was such a really like lovely story I don't think you have to read it around Christmas time but I'm glad that I did because it was just it was just perfect I also love the really mature way um, the book discusses like infatuation 
versus uh versus like connection with people and things so I, I really liked that and this book actually got super dark at times because of the like Pied Piper elements and yeah I just and all of the all of the like food described in this book just sounds amazing and I kind of want to live here now yeah I'd love to vacation here at least. And I gave The Enchanted Sonata 5 out of 5 stars. Next I finished Dragon Spear by Jessica Day George. This is the third and final book in the Dragon Flippers trilogy and unfortunately this is my least favorite. Basically one of the dragon characters is kidnapped and Creel and her friends have to go on an adventure to try and bring them back. And I just really didn't like this. Um, I didn't like the plot, like I didn't like the way the story went or the setting where we spent most of the book, uh, I just didn't, I didn't feel like the characters were as enjoyable either. There's, there was also a part where like they're on an island for a huge chunk of this book and there were some things that kind of made me uncomfortable about the way the native populations of this island were described, but I, th I think some of that was explained later based on, like it was actually used as commentary for like the way that some of the characters were treating uh, the population of this island, so I think there was a purpose to that, but I that was just, I don't know, that's just something to keep in mind. And I, I'm glad I finished the trilogy. I did end up giving this book three stars because there were some things about the ending I enjoyed. But there were also some things about the ending I really didn't like. So this was kind of a like meh, like it was fine. I do still highly recommend the first two books, but this one was just not my favorite. And then my last book of 2018 was unfortunately one of my least favorite books of the year, and that was Not the Girls You're Looking For by Amina May Safi. Okay, I was so disappointed. I really, really wanted to love this book. Here's what I thought I was getting when I went into this book, based on the synopsis. I thought this was going to be about a main character, a girl who is really exuberant and outgoing and outspoken, and she gets in trouble, but, you know, she, she kind of, like, she means well. I thought it was going to be about her realizing that her actions have consequences, and that there is a way to still be true to yourself and to your vivaciousness and your personality without hurting other people through carelessness and I, I thought it was going to be about strong family relationships and friendships and especially female friendships and I got absolutely none of that with this book. Um, wow, like, like nothing about this worked for me unfortunately. I really didn't like the main character and I can't even remember her name, Lulu. I really didn't like Lulu. Um, she, she was just so, she was so needlessly cruel and hateful towards people for caring about her and sometimes the weird thing was that sometimes she would notice it and she would feel bad but there was no indication that she actually wanted to change her behavior it was like she felt bad because she thought she was supposed to but it wasn't like she actually cared about the person she was talking to even when it was somebody who we're supposed to believe she had a close relationship with it just really didn't work lulu was just so so unlikable and not like an unlikable like complex female character that's going to put some people off i mean she was like just an incredibly bad person i think and her her friendships like her friend group there's like all this friend drama that happens in the novel and there's so many times where uh lulu will like they'll they'll try and make up or something and they'll be like i missed you so much and it was like it was like part of my heart wasn't with me and we're always together we can't do this ever again and i'm like are you kidding me like who are these friends you're talking about none of you guys like each other like the all of these girls fucking hated each other so like how am i supposed to feel any interest in them getting over their differences and making up it was like the, all of these friendships were like so toxic or just plain like bad and like not understandable and like i just didn't understand why any of these people wanted to be in the same room and frankly i think a lot of times they didn't want to be in the same room so i'm like why do we care if they end up like back in in their friendship group and also the romance was just so awful and ridiculous and like it, it was like the book was split in half and there were two male characters that just happened to have the same name. Like that's how different the portrayal was. It was like the beginning, it was like he was such an asshole and like Lulu was just not interested in him and they didn't like each other at all, like whatever. And then the second half of the book, it was like suddenly they're in love and it was just like so, so uncomfortable and weird. Like their their dialogue was just so cringeworthy and bad and I just didn't understand what they saw in each other except that Lulu's apparently super hot and maybe like I guess that's what made this guy interested in her and also it was like one of the most uncomfortable sex scenes I've ever read in a book it was just really bad um and they and on top of the unbelievable romance it was just like why is this happening like what and I also really didn't like the writing it's like metaphors that didn't make sense and sentence constructions that just didn't work for me there were a few passages this is one of the things I did think the book kind of did well it was like there were some passages that were talking about Lulu and how she felt kind of caught between cultures and even though that's not something I personally identify with I felt that those passages of the book were really well written and that was the moment when I really felt myself starting to 
like connect myself to Lulu and really invest that I felt really invested in her because these were done with such like those passages were done with such compassion and there were a few brief moments where she's spending time with some of her female family members when they're doing like wedding preparation and I loved those scenes actually like I really thought those were good but those were unfortunately very few and far between and everything else about this book I just I just really didn't like and something that really really bothered me um is I guess kind of a spoiler technically but I think it's important to talk about is what there's this guy who Lulu's interested in for a long time but she hates him but then uh they're dancing at a party and he like sexually harasses her or assaults her he puts his hand up her pants and it's really uncomfortable and disgusting and so she decides that she's gonna get back at him for that and her and her friends end up kind of doing this um this scheme to sort of make make it impossible for him to graduate and especially like because this is a pattern too it like not that it would be okay if he just did it to one girl but it's also a pattern he's been doing like he treats women like this all the time and they decide it's gonna stop so they like start doing this sort of vigilante justice thing make it impossible for him to graduate to punish him for this so that he knows he can't get away with this and then the last like two or three pages we hear that she decided not to because he left her friends alone and that just like if there was any chance that I was going to like warm up to Lulu as a main character by the end of the book that killed it because I just cannot I cannot understand that and I'm not blaming people who experience this and who don't report I know there are so many things going on and it's not it's not my place to tell people like you should report it but when she was already like it wasn't that she felt uncomfortable she was comfortable getting him kicked out of school or getting him like not getting his diploma she was okay doing that but she backed off because at least he wasn't doing it to her or her friends anymore. But she sees him dancing with another girl who's, I think, a couple years younger than him, too. She knows that this is going to happen again. And she's like, well, as long as he stays away from my friends, he's safe from me. Like, what the actual fuck? Like, that's just unacceptable to me. I thought that was just... It just left me with such a bad taste in my mouth about the whole book and about Lulu. And I also want to mention that though this is not an area of representation I can speak to, I read several Own Voices reviews on the Muslim representation of this book, and based on those, it sounds like it's not a good or accurate portrayal of Islam. So I would caution people who are seeking this book out for the Muslim representation to keep that in mind and to kind of read some reviews of that before you go into it. But yeah, I, I absolutely hated this book and I feel bad because I was so hoping to enjoy it, but I gave Not the Girls You're Looking For one out of five stars. Okay, well, I think that is one of the most uh, mixed months I have had in a very long time in terms of the range of star ratings there, but let me know if you guys have read any of these books, what you thought of them. I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!